guests, welcome to Getting Your Kid Involved in Adaptive Sports, the Parent Experience. We are really excited to host this uh, first session that's part of our three-part series, Adaptive Sports 101 for Parents. Uh, the series is meant to provide parents with kind of a, parents of children with disabilities with a starting point and understanding of how to get involved in the Adaptive Sports Network. So thanks for joining us. Um, we'll go over a few housekeeping items really briefly. All participants will be on mute and their videos will be turned off to minimize distractions. If you would like to submit a question, you will have the opportunity to do so. On your screen, you'll see a Q&A feature and we ask that you please submit those questions through that feature. Um, you can then utilize the chat to introduce yourself, say hi amongst each other. And finally, we'll be recording this webinar for others. Um, for others to access at a later time or for you to review if you would like, and we'll send that out in the follow-up email to this webinar. For those who are new to the Move United member network, um, one of the questions parents often ask is how do we find and connect into our local programs? And so the Move United network, membership network, um, is a network that consists of 164 organizations providing adaptive sports opportunities across 43 states um, to individuals of all ages and all abilities. So to find a local network near you, uh, we encourage you to visit moveunitedsport.org um, to find what chapter is near you and to connect with them directly. Now we'll turn it over to the stars of the show. So we, we're having a few technical difficulties, so please bear with us. Um, but I'll go ahead and ask the panelists we have with us now to introduce themselves and give us a bit of context to your background in adaptive sports and your experience with your adaptive athlete specifically. So uh, Ted, we'll go ahead and start with you if that's all right. Yes, um, my son, uh, oops, ready. my son uh, Jeremy is a uh, spina bifida. He's turning 16 this month. Uh, he started playing sled hockey eight years ago. Uh, he was, he about four years ago started archery, track and field as well. Um, our experience, uh, basically, we were looking for athletics for my son to do. And uh, it took us a little while to find some clubs. And, and now we're fully immersed and involved. I coach and I'm a board member of the Atlantic Hammerhead Sled Hockey Association. And uh, that's, that's where we're at today. Awesome, thank you, Ted. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. I'm Chris Duffy. My daughter, uh, Abby Duffy, is 16. She lost her eyesight when uh, she has partial eyesight uh, when she was six. And she's a natu naturally gifted athlete. And we picked up alpine skiing as our focus. And she's done several other sports. Um, but she's, she's training. We were on track to potentially make it to the 2022 Paralympics, but we uh, we got a little derailed by a little virus. So we'll see. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you both for joining us. Um, we may have a few others joining us throughout the webinar as well, and we'll introduce them as they hop on board. Before we get to some of our questions, we'd like to launch a poll um, to get the sense of who's joining us today. So in just a moment, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen. You should see it now. And if you could go ahead and respond to let us know who you are, that would be great. Just another minute here. Right. Thank you guys for responding to that. So it looks like we have a pretty even spread between parent of an adaptive athlete and adaptive sport provider, um, a few athletes themselves, and then a few um, representing other domains. So thank you for joining us. It's neat to see uh, such a variety today. So we've put together a few questions um, to pose to our panelists today. And these questions have come from questions that have um, been posed to our organization and different staff members and athletes in the past. Um, so the first one we'll start with is, how do I advocate for myself or my child in school sports and local programming? Um, so Ted, if you would like to go ahead and get started for us, that would be great. 
Uh, no problem. Um, one thing as a uh, like biggest obstacle is finding the sport for your child. And then the second part is how do you integrate it with the other programming? Uh, we do for our hockey team, we do collaborative efforts. We get the kids in sleds and we play and we provide them. So, you know, going with your uh, school administration and talking with them and finding out if they can host a game that your child can play in and put everyone in the same level uh, for say, perhaps he's in a, in a wheelchair, he or she is in a wheelchair or, or isn't, as, uh, uh, isn't going to be mobile, um, finding a way to bring everyone down to put them on an equal level. And uh, our program provides sleds. So we get the regular, uh, we get the able body hockey players in sleds to play against our team in sleds. Uh, we usually have a pizza party afterwards or something of that uh, effect and, and everyone kind of gets to see from a different aspect um, the challenges of an adaptive athlete. Awesome, thank you for that, Ted. Um, real quick, we'll break for a minute. We have two of our other panelists with us, so I'd love to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, Deb, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and give us just a little bit of context to your involvement in adaptive sports? Sure. Hi, guys. I'm Deborah Waddell Jackson. Um, I am now the mom of a 20 year old a track and field Paralympian. But he started out when he was nine years old with track. He was a kid that was exposed to many different sports horseback riding, basketball. We even played a little football, baseball, but track was, was what he was really good at, and he loved track. So we were able to align with an adaptive sports team that was about two hours from our home, but they kind of showed us the ropes and got us involved with the National Junior Disability Championships, connected us with other key individuals in the adaptive world, and fortunately, my son took off. Um, he started his international meets when he was 15. He was actually selected or he, he made the team, the Rio team when he was 16 years old and he's been competing ever since. Um, he competed in middle school as well, but his, the most exposure he got was in high school. And we were able to do that with the assistance of our state high school sports association. Um, it, it was not as smooth as I thought it could have been, but it took a lot of ongoing communication and dialogue. So that is something I highly suggest that you do if it reaches that level. But today he is um, fifth in the world. He is preparing for Tokyo and he's a rising senior in college. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deb. And thanks for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Tammy, I'd love to turn it over to you to introduce yourself as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tammy Kitterman. I am the mother to Brock Kitterman, a 15-year-old with deaf blindness. Uh, he's vision, legally blind and hearing impaired. He was introduced to adaptive sports at age five when attending a camp at a local college. He's tried many of the sports that were modified for the vision impaired. Um, he's, he loves skiing, kayaking, archery, hiking, whitewater rafting, rock climbing, but he ultimately landed on um, triathlons, which is a combination of the swimming, running, and biking, and blind ice hockey. Um, he started swimming at age six, discovered triathlons at age seven, decided he was good, th good at them, and just went on from there. Um, He's competed in over 70 triathlons. Um, two years ago, he started doing it as a para and because the triathlons have gotten bigger. So the youth races, he could navigate, he could remember the courses and, you know, between the guidance of going up and, and walking the course the night before and um, having family members at specific spots of the course to say, hey, danger area, be careful here. He worked out real well, but the triathlons got larger. He needed to, um, to have a guide. So now he has a guide for swimming. Uh, he rides a tandem bike and then he has a guide for running and he's doing wonderful in it. Um, uh, back in 2016, we discovered blind ice hockey. So uh, he tried hockey when he was younger and that just didn't work out being with fully sighted players. But um, we got hooked up with uh, some people from Canada and from Washington DC who both had blind ice hockey teams. 
and he became addicted. Loves the blind ice hockey. Fast forward to today, I now run uh, Pittsburgh Rhinos blind ice hockey team, and um, we're all thriving. Awesome, thank you so much, Tammy. As, as we can see, we have quite an engaged and involved group here. So I think we're gonna get some really great insight. Um, the question we had just been discussing that Ted had spoken to is how do I advocate for myself or my child in school sports and local programming? And I know we touched a little bit on that in the introductions, but uh, Chris, if you would like to give us your perspective, that would be great. Sure. Uh, there, it starts with what the athlete, my daughter, wanted to be involved with. Um, she's tried a, different, a number of different sports. She's tried crew. She's tried some other different, different sports. But skiing was her location. It's, it's her calling. So what I did is I contacted the school, the coaches, um, one of my taglines is early and often they don't know that there's there's a sense of fear when you when you bring something new like a blind athlete and meeting with the with the coaches with the coaching staff with the director of sports in the school uh, meeting with the principal their fear substantially came down and after her first season uh, they started really opening up. Um, but if you're just getting started, you have to really contact them. And I would say their number one uh, emotion up front is kind of a fear. It's fear of unknown, of the unknown. Our Alpine coach, for instance, had coached for 18 years, and he hadn't been throwing a curve curveball like this in that whole time. Um, so, but it's worked out well and he is now turned and he is our biggest advocate. So it, the tables have turned in a couple of years of Abby's participation, but that's how we advocate for what we need is early and often. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And Deb, I saw you nodding your head there. Would you like yeah. to um, either add on or, or provide some new insight there? Yeah, I, I, I um, really think every situation is going to be uniquely different, as are our children. Um, I didn't mention my son is a left leg above knee amputee. And um, that was unprecedented in our school districts for a, you know, a kid who wanted to compete in sports. So he started in middle school, but we had a coach who was willing to work with us. And I think, you know, forming allied ships, finding an ally who's willing to work with you and for you along this path is very helpful. But I knew he was also leaving middle school, going to high school. So I started working with the athletic director for the school system. That was the most beneficial because once he was clear on, on Desmond's um, journey and what he had in mind that he wanted to do. He disseminated that information down to the other coaches, not only at the high school that he was attending, but the other high schools that they would be competing with in the district. So the elevation of awareness, and it's, a, it's an entire educational process. They're learning, we're learning, um, but we wanted to do it as amicably as possible, and we still encountered bumps, but it's got to be ongoing dialogue at all times, in my opinion. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, you bring up a great point. Education, and it sounds resoundingly, education is key. Education um, is key. Thank you. Tammy, would you like to share your insights as well? Um, I don't have a great insight story for the schools. Unfortunately, our school, although we tried many times to get him involved with the swim team, um, the coaches there just weren't, weren't, ex weren't willing to work with us enough to make it worth our while. So we ended up going outside of our school district to join teams and find the places where Brock would best fit in. Um, and that wasn't hard to do. There's a lot of local community areas where it is, um, they're very open 
to kids with disabilities to take place in their sports. Sure, yeah, and I, I know, Tammy, you're not alone. I think it's great that we have such diversity represented in this panel because like I think it was Deb said, each individual's journey and experience is very unique. So thank you all for sharing on that. We appreciate it. The next question that's come up for us is, how do I establish a connection with other parents in the adaptive sports world? Um, so we'll switch it up this time. Tammy, would you like to start here? <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, when we get to these events, um, the parents even meeting for the first time, we're all best friends. I mean, we all have something in common. We're all going through the same struggles and, and meeting the different parents helps us, you know, find different ways and different activities and, and different events for our kids to participate in. And just becoming friends with them on Facebook after the event. We may not see them between this event this year and the event next year, but keeping up with their kids and their activities and having that, that group um, that you can reach out to and ask questions and and get feedback and advice from is it's phenomenal. I mean, it's a necessity. And I think everybody that is in this world is always looking for that next parent that can can be on their team, you know, of advisors. Absolutely. Thank you, Tammy. Deb, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um. I don't think I would have learned as much as I did or Desmond, my son, would have advanced as well as he did had it not been for parents. Parents are the best ambassadors for adaptive sports, for their encouragement, for their experience, for their guidance, um, just, just all of the life lessons they learn while charting this course. And I was a novice. I knew nothing. But the parents in Desmond's adaptive sports group guided me along the way. It even trickled down to one particular race Desmond didn't want to do. And he said, I don't want to run the 400. So I went back to the coach and said, no, he's going to pass today. He doesn't want to run the 400. A parent came over to me and said, Deb, do you think our kids want to be here? Do you think they're jumping at the bit to participate in, any, in each event? No, you tell him this is what he's going to do. She helped me get stand my back up, give me the encouragement and the strength, and it turned out to be one of his best events. So had I not had parents in my circle, I don't know that I'd be on this call today. So each one reached one, each one shares great stories, and the support is phenomenal. Awesome. I love that, Deb. Thank you very much. Yeah. Chris, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, I'm in a unique situation with Abby is I'm also her coach and uh, guide. So I'm the athlete side of it too. So I don't interact with parents as much as maybe some other parents do. I do see them at, um, you know, competitions and whatnot, but I interact more with the athletes because that's, it ends up being more where I am located in all these events. So I do mentor a couple of, of, you know, other guides, but I don't end up. Um, and then Abby also races a lot more with uh, able-bodied sports in because New Hampshire doesn't have a big Paralympic level skiing program. So we're often uh, interacting with able-bodied teams Um so I'm not a good one for interacting with other adaptive parents because there's not a lot for me to interact with, uh, both because I'm a guide and also because we're often ski racing with able-bodied skiers. Yeah, and that's all right. That's a really neat perspective you bring, Chris, and that you are uh, both an athlete and a supportive parent to your athlete. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you. And we'll touch on that more in the coming mm -hmm. questions as well. And Ted, last but not least, would you like to share for us? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I have a unique perspective because one, I, want, I run one program, so I don't talk to any of the parents and I try not to. And then the other program, I'm just a complete spectator. I'm a parent and uh, it's a very highly uh, 
regarded program. It runs very well and, and I learned a lot from there. Uh, dealing with the parents, one thing is um, I think dealing with adaptive sport program, uh, adaptive sports parents, you're going to find them to be slightly aggressive or assertive, uh, which is a good thing because they know where you're coming from. So knowing that their child, what they had to go through, they're going to be pretty open and honest and come right to you like, hey, this is what we went through. This is what's going on. As Deb touched base, she said, no, you're going to make your kid run the 400. Like that's, <laughs> you know, so I have heard that uh, same mind from every kid crying that they don't want to run this race or they're now tired. And all the parents like, no, no, you're sending your kid out there. Don't, don't let them, don't let them take advantage of you. This is for their own good. Um, and that's, that's what you learn. And uh, I think to, you're going to need to be open. You're going to have to understand is you're going to hear a lot of stories about a lot of different kids because you don't know where your child is going to fall in line at. You don't know what obstacles you're going to run into and what special needs you're actually going to need. Every, every situation is, is special. Every situation is different, whether it's a piece of equipment or this or that. So you want to take in all that information. You want to listen to what the parents are saying, and then you want to be open and honest about what you go through. There's definitely personal issues. I, I noticed some parents don't want to discuss about their child, maybe bathroom habits and things of that nature. You're on a team where everybody's going through that, where everybody has something similar to that, that aspect of their life. Everybody has some challenge to get through. And you're gonna find someone who's not necessarily identical in the situation, but someone else who has that similar thing. It's gonna shave a lot of experience off. Of, it's gonna shave a lot of problems off of your time listening to their experience. So whether it's, you know, here's our bathroom situation before events or the day before or the week before, here's how we handle that. Or whether it's, hey, your kid's trying to pull one over on you. They're, they're fine to run the 400. Everybody's tired. Like, you know, and, and those situations, um, the parents on your team have the best intentions. Also, I'd like to touch base and say, talk to the older players um, or older athletes on the team, because one, they're going to take more of a mentorship role over your child. And two, they're going to tell you how they felt when they were eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. They're going to tell you how they felt when their parents told them to do things and what they went through and what worked for them. And that's also a great experience that you're going to get to express to your child like hey this is what it takes to be good at that i think uh it sounds like all of our children here are, are to, competing at a high level uh also be mindful not everybody is your child may or may not be pushing uh, a paralympic level my son uh is i'm lucky enough that he goes to the development camp for USA Hockey for the last couple of years and is invited to try out for the development team and, a, and the Paralympic team since he's been 13 now. Um, they take 50 kids in the country. His coach for track and field is convinced that he's going to make junior team USA and whatnot. And, uh, you know, if he puts the effort in, he can. Um, he's in archery. He's done it for three years. Four, after the first four months, he won a silver in nationals and then the next two years he got gold and he was like 11 points away from the record there so he's just kind of a naturally athletic kid uh the only thing for that is he has spina bifida so he's got to find adaptive sports to play in um i have kids that can skate for two minutes on the ice and they got to come back and pull themselves out of the situation so always be mindful one listen to the other parents two have realistic expectations for your child and three make sure you're pushing your kid you know, they're out there to sweat. They're out there to be healthy. So talk to the parents, see what they went through, learn their experiences. Awesome. All great points, Ted. Thank you very much. So the third question that we've had come up is, how do I affect changes in existing programming that may not be inclusive? And this is a pretty big question to tackle. Um, but I would love to start with Chris, you this time, if you'd be willing to um, provide your insight as it pertains to you and Abby. Sure. Um, again, I'm gonna have to stick with that alpine skiing because that's what we know is we, there was a lot of different pieces um, to adapting a ski race. And you have to, you have to pick your battles. So let's say we go into the first season, there's 13 things we would like to see happen. And what we did is like anything else, we picked two. And if we felt if we could accomplish those two, we would have accomplished something. Um, there's, there's certain rules for adaptive uh, skiing where we get to inspect the course early, we get to um, go before the rest of the team, the, lots of different pieces. 
so when we affect the changes, we would make a list. Again, we present it to coaches. We prevent, uh, present it to the school. But we wanted to work collabor collaboratively with them as opposed to um, starting off with, we, these are the rights we have and this, how are you going to accommodate us? We'd like to work, work with you. And after two seasons, we have pretty much all 13 of those accommodations accomplished. But I think it's because we work together with them and we pull them in as opposed to being demanding. Uh, so I think you affect change like with anything else is the more it can be their idea. In fact, uh, there were some other things on our list we practically had given up on and our coach started to advocate for us. Um, you know, there's a concept of condensing where I put it in his head. Here's some things that we'd like, but we're not going to press for them. He started pressing for them for us. And so I think the big thing here is, again, the other answer was, you know, how do you or when do you contact early and often? And the more you can make it a collaborative experience with everybody involved, I think the better, at least it's been my experience, the better it goes. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's a really great perspective. We appreciate that. Deb, I'd love to turn it over to you next. Um, I think he, he uh, Chris made a really good point about collaboration. And um, along with collaborations, I think for as a parent, you got to pack a lot of patience. Um, so while we're teaching and educating and advancing, you know, the, the boundaries, um, change is not always rapid, it's rather slow. And I'm going to go back to the parent association. If you've aligned with parents who've been successful in their states or in their districts with getting your t kids, gaining access for your kids to, um, to participate in sports, tap into what some of the things that they've done. I did quite a bit of Googling to make sure we were on board. I mean, where we should be. And while the, the city athletic director allowed Desmond to compete on his high school team with, against other schools, when he advanced to state, they made him compete by himself. So anybody knows on a track team, if you're running against someone, that makes you a tad bit faster. But it took quite a bit of work to get them to understand that. And it took work for the athlete. You got to bear in mind how the athlete is feeling. So Desmond has run races before by himself and cried his eyes out at the end because you're working with your own disability and you're under the spotlight. So now I got to get the people on the other side of the desk to understand that part of it also. So rally the troops, do your due diligence in trying to find out as much as you can. Uh, try to find a disabilities rights group who might give you a little bit of muscle if you think you get to that point and you need somebody else to support you. But tapping into existing programs that know nothing about adaptive sports can be uphill, but doable. And it's just taking, it's gonna take patience. We gotta just keep open dialogue and just know that not only are you helping your kid, you're helping the kids that come behind your kids. Awesome. Thanks, Deb. And I know it's funny that everything kind of comes full circle and that we had started talking about education and education is exactly what's needed to implement these changes and affect these changes. And then the parents and the, the resource groups come back into play as being that support system. So, exactly. Thank you. Thank um, you. Ted, I'd love to turn it over to you. Um, I think we're all going to have a similar uh challenges. I think we all have similar challenges that we dealt with. So I'm going to kind of touch base on some of the things that they said and something I said earlier as well. Uh, Deb was talking about um, her child racing by himself. And um, yeah, that's that you see that a lot. And you don't you see two or three events a year where your child is actually racing someone at the same classification or the same abilities as him. Um, and the same thing with the hockey is, is I have 10 kids on the ice playing each other that are all at a completely different level, whereas an able body sport is, you know, 12 and 13 year olds against each other, like maybe your difference in ice hockey, 
and there's an A and a B team. I think it's now all A teams. But there's no B team anymore. I think it's A, double A, and triple A, but whatever. The, uh, you know, you're paired in a level with your peers where you're playing at a certain level. So there's so many challenges that we face for this. And then getting other programs uh, that aren't already inclusive. Um, of course, uh, the Hammerheads were completely inclusive program for everyone. We do uh, allow able bodies to be involved. We have, um, I have a junior team and we started an adult team and I try to break my junior team into a novice and a, and a junior competitive team and separate it. The kids kind of shift between some of the levels depending on where we're going. So we kind of are on the extreme end of being inclusive, but we're an adaptive sports program. But what we do is collaboration, which was mentioned. We play the able body teams and we get them sleds. I will advocate for USA Hockey here. I don't know if Tammy has the same experience with the blind hockey, but one, when you do the coaching program and all, they touch base on all of the disabled sports. They actually have someone in charge of sled hockey. I believe they have someone in charge of the blind hockey. Does that fall under sled hockey as well? Some, one way or the other. We have blind hockey representative. Yeah, so they have separation for that already with USA Hockey. They're actually really inclusive, and they're, uh, they're, they're I have my issues. I won't, I won't air them out here. Um, just about getting the competitive letter, letter, uh, nature and all. They have a different mindset of some things, but they're, they're actually a great program. They actually, if you send them a letter, they'll send the sleds to the able body program to play your program. So they'll provide the sleds. They ship them, and then they return them, and they pay for it. So um, full circle back in there where Deb was talking about finding an advocate and all, we have that for USA Hockey, which is awesome. You don't find that as much in some of the other adaptive sports. The, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of people involved with the track and field, so you'll find a lot of great stuff there if you network with the right people or the right programs. Um, but finding grants to and finding local businesses, I think will help be inclusive. Because if you can find somebody who will put the money forth um, for a local program to play yours, to be involved, to run an event, um, those things will be great. So it's just getting, uh, having the patience to do it. Uh, understanding, you need to understand that in Tammy's situation, uh, where her son, she took him to swim, you were talking about that, the coach was probably very apprehensive because he didn't know how to deal with it. Right. We have to understand that, like, you know, we're going through something and, and we have to push because it's our child and we want to get them at this level or we want to get the same opportunities. So writing a letter to the school, writing a letter to the other programs, I think is important. It gives them an idea to, it gives them a minute to digest it before you, for lack of a better word, get in their face and say, hey, I, I, I want to. I have this idea, let's show this. So you write a letter and you explain things. Um, you give little excerpts of, of what you've gone through. Uh, one of the parents told me, I'll try to cut this short. I know I, I hog up a lot of time. Uh, one of the parents said to me one time, um, you know, I never seen my kid sweat until the first practice for ice hockey. You know, he came and, you know, I just, I never seen it. I was so excited. And it, it really kind of resonated. Like, yeah, when does our child have the chance to get his heart rate up? When does that child actually get to expel his full energy? You know, when do they get to do that in a fun manner? Not, you know, getting up, getting dressed in the morning, getting up and being excited to, to go compete. So maybe sharing some of those stories and writing it like, hey, my son or daughter does this or blah, 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 you know, and this is the situation we're in. How about he practices with the track team? You know, I, I know a, a several situations where the uh, disabled athletes practice with their track team and they cheer them on and they run the events and then maybe finding someone to front some money to bring some of the other children from another state, you know, put them up in a hotel, right to the hotel. Maybe they'll get, maybe they'll donate the rooms and then you get three athletes to come up and you have an event with three of them going around in a wheelchair or running uh, with a walker or whatever the situation is. So, so patience, understanding and, 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 and uh, discussion. That was the other one you want to discuss and it's going to take a long time to get these you know get this all working and get the particulars worked out great thank you ted and tammy would you like to add any anything additional to that no i think they've really covered it all i've been very fortunate with the blind ice hockey we it's it's set up just beautifully through usa hockey and as far as triathlons go I have been so fortunate to work with some phenomenal race directors that I just go into them and say, listen, Brock's been racing with you as a youth athlete for years now. So now he's moved up and these are the new um, accommodations that we need made to the race so that he can 
he's able to continue. We need, you know, to have our own place in transition. We need to start to swim a little sooner than everybody else so that they're not all getting t tripped up in his swim tether. Um, you know, he's going to have a tandem bike and all of the race directors have been phenomenal in um, making the accommodations to make sure that he's able to race. Awesome. Thank you, Tammy. And again, it's, it's really great to hear about all the different sports because everybody's coming from <laughs> a very individual experience. So thank you. The fourth question we have here is, how do I establish a positive working relationship with school administrators? And to give this a little bit more context, this question came up because with an understanding that oftentimes to get to many of these competitions and events and practices, there's a lot of travel involved, sometimes more so than um, the typical sports that are associated with schools. So um, how about Tammy, would you like to start out for us? Well, sure. So um, from day one, I've always had a great relationship, made sure I had a great relationship with the principal and the key people within the school district. Um, elementary school, you know, I was on that PTO. I was at that school constantly making sure they knew that I was there, making sure Brock's getting the attention that he needs and to, to know that they're, that he isn't like everybody else because Brock doesn't have that disability that you see. You know, the vision and hearing impairment, to glance at him, he looks just like every other kid. Um, but, you know, so when it was time to say, hey, listen, you know, Brock's participating in these sports that aren't your typical sports. They require a lot of travel. So I will be taking him out of school. Um, last year, you know, first year of high school, we are three days into school and I took him out to attend a camp at the USA uh, Paralympic, Tri um, Paralympic Olympic Center uh, in um, Colorado. And, you know, I just explained to the teachers, this isn't your typical sports where you're practicing every day at school and having an event on the weekends or Friday night football. So, you know, they've made it really easy for us. You know, I give them enough notice. I give them the respect of, you know, we're going to be leaving a month from now. I will make sure he does his homework while he's away. Um, you know, give it to him beforehand. He can catch up and just nine times out of 10, they will mark it as a educational field trip. Awesome, thank you very much, Tammy. Ted, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, um, well, one, I have to mention, my kids' teachers are dreadful. Uh, I can't deal with them. We homeschool, and uh, so I don't have to deal with that so much. So we're very lucky and fortunate, but a lot of our parents do from our organization. And what I would say to that from uh, my experience running the program and our understanding of what it does for children uh, is where you need to express that to your school administrators. I don't think you're going to find any problems, just as Tammy said, and no, no, not one of our children has any issue. They pretty much, uh, I guess they label them as educational field trips and whatnot. They've been all excused absences. There's been no absence. I'm sorry, they've not actually been documented as absences. So you need to express to the principals and the administrators the mental health and physical health aspects of the adaptive sports programs and why they're so important. Um, you need to make sure that they understand that the obesity rate is three times higher for a disabled athlete, same as heart disease, um, depression. Um, and I totally wanted to look up the percentage of that. The depression rate is through the roof too for, for disabled athletes. So you need to express that to them for one. And you need to give them a visual comparison of, okay, you, the football program looks like this, the baseball program looks like this, and line up how many practices they have a week and, and, and how many teams they play and how many games they play and explain to them, say, this is all within 30 to 45 minutes, max two hours of our program. And they can do all these games and events. None of these exist for my child. And this is what I have to do. So I think, you know, being uh, patient, of course, uh, um, persistent, and, and having that conversation. And, and also the understanding is this is gonna be new to the school program unless they've dealt with this before. So also having that understanding is there's gonna be a reluctancy or a, it's gonna take a minute for them to process, which is why I always suggest writing the letter first and sending it in to schedule a time to sit down. Cause then they'll go on the computer and they might hit something and go, oh wow, I didn't know any of this information. Give a couple of key points and let them know. Um, you're not gonna really, there's a 99% chance you're not gonna have any issues with the school administrator, to be honest. Oh, that's about it. Great, thanks for sharing that, Ted. Deb, would you like to touch on this as well? 
Oh, Deb might have had to hop off for a minute, oh, yeah. but Chris, we'll we'll turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, one of the key words I had thought of uh, before when uh, Deb was talking and Ted just mentioned it too, is you need to be persistent. And one of the, the issues um, we had was they got caught up in what was legal rather than what was possible. And that took a little while to overcome because um, they wanted to make sure there was a latency between everything we asked for and their answers. And they were going through their legal department to make sure what they were obligated to do. And it took a little while to get them comfortable that that's not the angle we're coming at them with. Um, and it, when we became more collaborative, the walls came down. Um, at first, the school was very adamant that Abby had to, we had to work within a framework of absences and they've even, the walls have even come down there, where as long as she is um, attending as she can, making good grades, they barely pay attention to our absences anymore, which is just amazing. It was a quite a dodging game there for two years um, to try to make sure that she, you know, didn't get held back. Um, and one of the things that, I think really broke the walls with them was Abby just wants to feel part of the team. So they, that means riding the bus, even though I'm driving to the same locations as them, Abby can ride the bus and feel part of the team, even though she just like any other kid complains about riding the bus. It's part of the team experience. Um, after a meet or something, she's on a bus and they're going over how the meet went. And then I, I drive right from the meet to school and pick her back up again. But it took a while for the school to, and the coaches to understand she wants the fully immersed feel for the sport, not just some. We train generally since she's adaptive on the East and there's not a lot of competition here. We generally train in a bubble anyways. Don't make the, the high school sport don't put her in a bubble there too. And like I said, as soon as we, their walls came down and they stopped looking to their lawyers before they would talk to us, um, we felt we've made a lot, like I told you before, the coach is now one of our biggest advocates. So that's 180 degrees different than where we started. Um, so that's how I really try to establish a positive relationship with the school with the administrators, with the coaches and everybody. And it's, and it's working, but you had to be persistent to get there. Great, thank you for sharing that, Chris. And mm -hmm. I think a really important point you brought up amongst many um, was that sports are not just physical, but also um, very social for individuals. So that's really great to keep in mind. Deb, is there anything you'd like to expand on with this question? Um, um just ongoing communication. I, I, I can't stress that enough. I mean, um, one year you may have administrators who completely get it or in your corner want to work with you. And if there's a change the next year, you find yourself right back at square one, trying to, you know, explain, educate, defend all of the above. Um, and with hopes that you're going to have a successful outcome. I think um, Chris made a really good point that, you know, being on the team means more than competition. It means so many other things. And there's a huge psychological component to this, as we all know. So just, just you know, recognizing the fact that he's going to be on the bus, he's going to be a part, they're going to debrief, talk about, get, you know, revved up in, in preparation for their event. Is all huge and just hope and pray that the school administrators listen to the kids, listen to the parents, listen to themselves and agree that this is this is a path we wanna we wanna blaze this trail. Yes, yeah, new and different, but it's a win-win for everybody. Everybody wins across the board. So um me, being new and different is a good thing. We're all uniquely different, you know, whether it's visible or not, like Tammy said, everybody's uniquely different. And 
that's what makes it a great place. I mean, you know, that's how you make a world with different people. Well put, thank you very much, Deb. Oh, go ahead, Ted. Uh, so Chris had mentioned legal and it kind of started some things turning back in my head. The reason why we homeschool is actually because the school was for lack of a better word, I guess they discriminated against my child, maybe. Um, didn't really, don't really think of it because it was so long ago. Um, the Philadelphia school system, to be honest, uh, my son was bused to a different school Turns out I moved five minutes from that school and I was between two different schools and my son was having some issues with schooling at first. And this kind of doesn't have to do with the sports, but just something that we went through and I felt it's something that I should mention because other people, you know, are going to be dealing with the school administrators and such. Um, when we went to the other school, I said, okay, great. Well, we're five minutes from the school. I want to bring my other son because I'm bringing one kid to one school and one kid to the other school. And, and like, I can't pick them both up at the same time. So I wanted my other son to go to the same school that my disabled child was in um, because he was already there and stable. They already had his bathroom procedures down. They already brought the equipment in they needed for him and everything. And they were great at that school. So I was like, all right, perfect. I'll just bring my other son there. And the principal would not take him. She wanted to she said, okay, don't go to the other school. And so my son's already been held back a year. And, uh, you know, he's already in a class where he's got to leave for bathroom breaks. He has to leave to, you know, to do different things. And um, he has scheduled regimented where he's missing class. I think he's already spent two years at this school. Like, why not, you know, give me the opportunity? So I went to this, even the Philadelphia school board said, I don't understand why the principal's not signing this. So we did go through some issues. I went to the Catholic schools and I went to the private schools um, afterwards. And actually the Catholic school that's a couple blocks from my house, um, they couldn't take them because they didn't have elevators and stuff like that. And they said, we'd love to take both of your children, blah, blah, you know, all that. And they found other schools and all. It just wound up being the best option. And even the principal there after meeting my wife and I, they said, you know, I think you guys would be fine to homeschool. Um, they said, but we can find other programs and we'll get you in touch with this private school and that school. To be quite honest, the cost was kind of high on the private end uh, uh, so we wound up doing the homeschooling um but that's why we're so adamant about all the sports and my son does all these things so he does get the he does get peers and he does get that socialization and, and you'll find it outside of the school through these programs more so than you will at school probably great thank you ted thanks for sharing that experience um, and thank you everybody for, for all of your insight into those past couple questions. I would love to turn it over to the audience now. If you do have any questions, please feel free to submit through that Q&A feature. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next 15 minutes. So we have lots of great ones coming in. We'll start with, what are the panelists' thoughts when youth athletes need to choose a focus sport? As with able-bodied, younger athletes are encouraged to try many sports, but we are seeing the age of when a focus should be, a focus of, oh, sorry. We are seeing the age of when a focus should be chosen is getting younger and younger. So feel free, if anybody um, would like to start off with that, go ahead. I'll go, I guess. Um, I'll go, because we're involved in so many different sports. Uh, Deb will probably have a, uh, you mind that I say Deb instead of Deborah? I didn't even ask. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just realized I've been shortening everyone's names. Anyway, um, we have athletes that come to our team from different sports, and they've more or less drugged my son to play other sports. Uh, you hear a lot of rumblings from the parents, like, oh, they got to pick a sport. They got to pick a sport. They have to pick a sport. I, I don't get involved in that. You know, I have a child who, uh, he's an adult now, I guess, who's very close in numbers to, to make uh, an, uh, an Olympic run for a track and field. And to be quite honest, he's really good at the sled hockey. He doesn't, he's only been playing for a couple of years, so he doesn't have the, the entire sport down yet, but physically he's, he's dominant speed wise. Like he's, you know, he's, he's good and uh, he can get better. And, and people are saying, Oh, you know, he shouldn't be doing the hockey. You know, the kid loves to do it he has fun doing it. It's got to be a personal choice for the player. If they want to play multiple sports and not focus on one, I think that's, that's on them. Um, you know, as they get older, I think we have this idea that we're pushing our kids to be this dominant athlete in some sport. Like they're all going to make the Paralympic team or they're going to make the NFL. Or if, if, if the child's 10 and 11, I played ice hockey and, and at 10 years old, my family turned around and said, that kid's making the NHL. I mean, you know, all the other parents know. Everybody watching knows if you, if you don't have that exact feeling with your child, I think you got to let them let them experience and have fun and be on the on multiple sports. If 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 it's the idea that he's really 
or she is really at that level, it's a conversation you have with a child and, or teenager or adult. And it's a decision that I think ultimately they, they have to make, not the parent. Great. Thank you, Ted. Would anybody else like to speak to that? I can pick up from where Ted was going is um, even though I'm Abby's guide and I'm an athlete, I remember this is her life, not mine. I'm just along for the ride and I do advocate, but it has to be her dream. And but there are things as I coach her that there's a natural distilling where things she to say yes to some things, she has to say no to some other things. So she's had to give up crew. She's had to give up some other things to focus on skiing. But I think if you help guide the athlete, the athlete, they will naturally be selective in what they want to do. Uh, you just have to lay out the framework that there's only so many hours in a day and so many resources, money, sponsorships, and otherwise, um, that you have to start committing to something. Or if, and I left this to Abby, if you just want to be a free skier and you want to switch to another sport or you just want to do high school sports, again, it's, we're just guides to our athletes. It's their lives. So if she just wanted to be recreational sports wise, like in high school, that's fine. Um, she's driven for more. And when that comes, you just have to advise your athlete. This is what you're signing up for. And this is what this means. And when you have sponsors, this is what this means. Um, and I, I think the athletes choose their own adventure. You just have to guide them. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Tammy, I saw you had raised your hand as well. Is there something you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean like, so Brock and I sit down basically January 1 each year and I say, okay, these are the upcoming triathlons. These are the upcoming events for the year. You pick and choose what you wanna do. Um, he goes through and he picks what he wants and I say, okay, well, you're making a commitment. So you need to commit to these and you need to commit to the training to do these. Because if I'm going to make the commitment to Sherpa you to all of these and, and pay for them and put my time and energy into it, you need to commit also. You know, but in addition to that, I make sure that he gets, a, he's completely well-rounded in other activities also. So when we go to a triathlon, we camp at that triathlon. So that includes the kayaking, the rock climbing, um, you know, the, there's a rifle range there. I mean, so we make sure that he gets well-rounded in a lot of sports rather than just that, you know, the two sports that he's chosen to be what he wants to compete in. We make sure that he gets a taste of everything else too. And he's never um, cemented into that particular sport. You know, now when he makes his commitment on January 1 for that year, well, that's his commitment. He need, he's at an age that he needs to know how to follow through with the commitment. And, um, but then he has that chance the following year to say, you know what, mm, didn't work for me last year. Let's change it. Let's, I'm, I think I'm kind of running out of steam on this. So maybe I'll look more into this this year. So he's always given that opportunity. Great, I love that plan. Thank you, Tammy. Deb, did you want to add anything here as well? No, I, I think I agree with the other panelists. It is, it's driven, in my opinion, by the athlete. I mean, I provide, um, you know, the transportation. I take care of my end. It's kind of like I, my, my agreement with my son for school was um, I work, my, I go to my job and your job is to go to school. So when he competes, you know, that's the line that you've chosen. Um, I like it as much as you like it while you're in it. And when that fades, do you want to change? Okay, I'm on to the next thing. But I, in that I don't step on the track, I'm, I have to let him drive that shit. Thanks, Deb. So another question we have come in here is, how do you get the, or how could I get the recreation programs in my town to be able to start a program? The recreation director is all for this. So how can we get the word out to disabled athletes, regardless of what their disability is, to come and see what we have to offer. And I know several of you have um, very relevant experience in this, so I'd love to open the floor to you guys. Um, 
can I start? So because Desmond is an amputee, um, I started a, a, a amputee support group when he was nine or 10 years old, but my audience was rather captive because it was the other youth who were coming to his prosthetic shop or it was through the physical therapist who worked with amputees. So with that um, being able to have easier access, it was great to pull those people together and to reach out, um, Kayla, to groups like Move United and ask, say, hey, this is what I wanna do. Can you guys steer me in the right direction? Do you have somebody you can send to help me or challenged athletes or other organizations? who can help you put on various clinics to move those, those programs along. But it's help out there now, unlike it used to be in years past. It's growing. I can't say enough about Move United. Move United is a perfect organization to, to promote these types of programs and activities. So yeah, it's just a matter of reaching out. Thank you, Deb. Would anybody else like to chime in here? I'll go. Sure, um, thank you, Ted. <laughs> I was waiting for everyone else. I'm, I'm an aggressive or assertive person. I played ice hockey forever, so I'm in everybody's face. Um, so starting a program, there's a couple things that I think you really need to, to look into or understand. One is sustainability of the program. You're going to have people who are willing, people who are going to jump in, and people who want to be involved, but they're going to want direction. And you're all going to be looking at each other without direction. So you're going to have to meet and brainstorm and, and, and basically line up a, an itinerary or a, um, a, you know, drawing a blank on the word I was looking for. We'll stick with itinerary. There was a better word. Uh, but you're going to basically break down what needs to be accomplished. You're going to need sustainability of the program, uh, and that means funding whether it's sponsorship, grants, and things of that nature. Uh, I would also look into being a 501c3 program. You wanna be a nonprofit because then you can solicit for funds. You can then collect, uh, you can apply for grants, you can get different donations and stuff. Um, so that, that's the first thing I would look at is, is the structure of your program, the sustainability and the funding of it. Um, the rest of that, nowadays we're in a great situation where if it's track and field, there's a, college program, Illinois, Arizona, you can get information from them. Everyone's so forthcoming in this, in the adaptive sports programs to give you information. The areas where people are reluctant to, I think is funding because not every program has the funding uh, that some of the bigger or better programs, when I say better, I don't mean better as, as a, a, a by principle or mission, I'm saying better is that they're better at fundraising and more organized. The Hammerheads last year, I think we raised $115,000 for our ice hockey program. So I was able to support three or four teams through different tournaments and stuff and able to offer the real, uh, the real equivalent to an able body program. We had 35 games for our juniors. We had a novice level. We had a junior competitive level. I took our juniors and put them in an adult level so that they could play uh, against athletes that were in the same uh, category as them. They played adult A-level, my 14 and 15 and 16 year olds. I have you know, a couple older kids on the team too and a few men now. Um, so our, our program uh, looks for sustainability, funding, sponsorship, grant writing. Uh, what was it? Um, Disabled Sports USA's website has a bunch of uh, individual grants and so you'll find some team grants on there perhaps. Challenged Athletes Foundation has individual grants. You'll find all those funding online when you start clicking those links and, and you start you know really diving into it and you'll find the specifics of what to look for. Uh, look at your state program um, and see who is uh, who donates a lot there. Banks, larger businesses, corporations get I said, uh, start with funding, I think, is your, your main source. Um, you'll find the parents coming involved, uh, the recruiting and those things. You're going to have to kind of find the area and the demographic that you're looking for. Um, that stuff, brainstorm and meet, have that discussion. Thank you, Ted. And to just chime in here as well, um, if anybody is looking to start up an adaptive sports organization or organization that um, serves athletes with disability, please do feel free to reach out to Move United as well. Um, we have a membership services department that serves individuals directly and help provide guidance um, as it relates to that. Either Chris or Tammy, is there anything you guys would like to add as well? No, I think this has been a good discussion. I uh, hopefully it gave a good feel for how to get, get and keep your athlete involved. Um, do your research, be collaborative, be persistent. 
great. Or even, Thank you. even direct them into a direction of an established, um, I'm sorry, an, es an established program already. You know, just pointing them in that direction. If someone were to come to me and say, I want to start a triathlon team, I would point them in the direction to dare to try. Because they're the people that I know that know adaptive um, triathlon. So I would do that for any of the sports. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. And that brings back that collaboration aspect as well. So thank you for sharing that. Go ahead, Ted. Sorry, this is actually, sorry, I'm terrible at this. Um, just to tie in this and understanding why I, I'm fundraising is such a huge thing and the money in the sports and, and dealing with the other programs. Um, there's a couple teams that have tagged on to an existing program. Uh, one ice hockey program is the nonprofit version of another program so that they can fundraise and all. Think in terms that you may be the parent of a child right now and you might be, you know, upper class or upper middle class and be able to afford these sports or be able to afford the travel. And you're like, oh, you know, I don't need to apply for this grant or oh, that's not important. But there's another kid who isn't. There's another kid coming from poverty. Like, you know, there's another adult who's 24 living on social security. He can't travel for these events. That's actually why I, I push so much about the fundraising and keeping that sustainability aspect. You don't turn anyone away that way. I have a guy come to the program who's 28 years old and can't afford to do anything. He volunteers time at a hospital. Like he, he is a volunteer that he, he goes and helps other disabled people. And, and this guy can't afford to play. I, I, I find all the money for him to play because he deserves a chance to play. And he's, he's a really good guy. Um, he's a good individual. And uh, there's thousands of other men like him in the country and kids. I have other pro uh, kids on our program who I, I know the parents can't afford to pay. Uh, I don't ask. We don't talk about it. Um, I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, there's things that I had to give and trade for. And I have this talk a lot of times uh, when we go, we did an event for Challenge Athletes Foundation and I said, you know, I'm speaking from one aspect and I'm, you know, your average middle class individual, which I'm sure everyone says. And, and, you know, I struggle. I have to take days off from work that I can't. I have to pay to travel to Chicago to play three hockey games where if my son was able-bodied, I could travel 20 minutes away. And I, I can't, I don't have that. So fundraising is huge for that. There's, a, there's other kids in the program and other adults that, that you know, you want to be included in your program. Good point. Thank you very much, Ted. I know we're, we're coming up on time and we've had lots of great questions. We'll start to wrap up. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists who have joined us here today um, and who've been so open with your experiences thus far. I know one of the questions that did come up um, and was mentioned a few times is that funding, the funding opportunities. And I just wanted to plug that currently Move United does have an elite team training grant open through July 27th. Uh, mm -hmm. That grant is open for 13 to 24 year olds and is a training grant for summer or winter sports of up to $500. Um, so if you're interested in that and your athletes eligible, please feel free to go ahead and check out our website. We'll plug it in the follow-up email as well. Um, if you enjoyed this session or know that other parents are, would be interested in this opportunity, feel free to share the next two upcoming sessions with them. Um, the second will be, where do I start? Advice from medical and adaptive sports providers. And the other will be, your child is transitioning. How are you? And that is a focus on the transition to college. So thank you again to everybody who's joined us. Um, please feel free to go check out our website if you're interested in starting up an organization, um, looking at those grant opportunities, or additionally, we do have an Adapt at Home campaign right now, which features a bunch of virtual events that um, you can tune into. Um, we recently started as well an Adapt at Home fitness kit initiative, and that is um, a box of at-home equipment that you, your athlete can use to stay engaged and um, fit at home and if you're interested in that or you know somebody who has a disability who would be interested please go check out our adapt at home website you can register your needs there um, if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to us directly but thank you again to everybody this has been a wonderful time and we hope to see you in the future as well